Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Value of Research in the Creative Process, hosted by yours truly, William Bastinon. I am a grade 11 student at ESA uh, in visual arts and double majoring in music theater. Uh, and I will be talking about the value of research in the creative process. Um, so to start it off, I'd like to give you a little uh, a thought experiment to sort of uh, leave you with a little thought. Um, think back to when you were a little child, um, very young, old enough to read, but uh, not old enough to think really well. Um, and think uh, back to when you were a child and you were writing your first story. You had just read a book and it was your favorite thing in the world. Um, it's amazing. Uh, this 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 sort of experience in the childhood is very true to me, and it's true to a lot of people I talked about. Um, so maybe it's true for you too. Um, think back to when you were a child writing your first story. Uh, you just read a book, you love it, and um, you wrote your own story. You think I'm going to write my own novel, just like this one. You write a zillion pages, and you write it and you finish it, and you think this is incredible. And then when you're a little older, you go back to it and you find it out of your basement. And I read it and I was like, oh, this is just a blatant this is plagiarism of the book that I really liked. Um, this was not inspired by it. This is just plagiarism. Um, I, but you did it as a child and you loved it because you loved the book and you loved writing and you loved doing all that. Um, but when you're older, you're like, oh, this is not even derivative. It's just plagiarism. Uh, I know this experience was true for me and a lot of people. So just keep this sort of in your mind throughout this presentation. I'm gonna come back to it, but just keep this thought of childhood in your mind. Um, now, before I let, before we start, I should clarify what is research, since I'm going to be talking about that for the duration of this presentation, I might as well clear it up. Uh, I think that research is the pursuit of clarity. Uh, so it's no surprise that uh, Mr. Vary, the head of the contemporary arts program at ESA, always says we strive for clarity in our program. He's said something like that, probably. Um, so it's also no surprise that ESA Contemporary Arts is a research-based program because we strive for clarity and we're research-based. However, what is clarity? Uh, I think that clarity is understanding, being clear about something, whether that is the art or media that you're taking in or the art or media that you make, or understanding the world that you're in or understanding uh, everything, just understanding, um, being clear, having clarity. Uh, however, clarity is impossible. Uh, true clarity, true understanding uh, can never be attained. You can never know everything about a subject, no matter how hard you try, um, at least in my opinion. And also the opinions of some of my good friends, such as uh, Aristotle. Um, he has this quote, although he said it in like 20 pages and in Greek, um, as he does, but this is sort of the gist. Um, the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. The more you get into a subject and begin to dip your toes in, um, the more you realize, oh, there's so much I have to know. And the more you learn, the more venues open up that you realize, oh, I have to know this. Um, this is also illustrated in something called the Dunning-Kruger effect, um, which is a scientific study done by these scientists, Dunning and Kruger. It's been redone over the years, um, but they, it's basically they graph um, someone's uh, confidence in their own abilities over their uh, competence in their own abilities. Um, so they're how, how good they are at something versus how good they think they are. Uh, so when you just start out at something, you're just dipping your toes in, uh, they found that you just have a, a burst of confidence. You suddenly think you're the best at this. There's a, um, uh, a, let's say, uh, a story of this uh, bank robber who robbed a bank and covered his face in lemon juice because he read that uh, lemon juice was in invisible ink and he thought it would make him invisible. Um, obviously it wouldn't, but he had just dipped his toes into the subject and he said, oh, invisible ink, lemon juice. I must know everything about this. So I'm becoming very confident. Uh, that is the peak of Mount Stupid as they call it um, right there in that little graph. But then suddenly when you learn everything about it, or not learn everything, but learn a little bit about a topic, you become very, not confident and you, as you realize how much you have to learn. Uh, this is where a lot of people drop out of like piano or dance classes or just where a lot of people quit because they think, oh, how am I gonna get up there? I'm, I'm never gonna become that good at something. But slowly over time, if you work on your skills and you stick with it, you'll become more and more confident and more and more competent. Uh, and it's a equal competent confidence from that point on. 
Uh, so therefore more clarity is more confidence and more research is more clarity. So more research is more confidence. Except research is really difficult. It's not an easy thing. It's not easy to know stuff. It's not easy to um, learn about research and not easy to do research. Uh, especially, um, this is um, further illustrated by the information era that we live in where uh, surprisingly, when you have all this information right at your fingertips, it's hard to know where to start, where to go, what to research. Um, so oftentimes it's just, well, I might as well not do it at all because how, how am I going to learn anything in this never ending pool of information? What's right? What's wrong? But I hopefully can give you a couple tips about how I research and what I've learned about research and um, how research affects my art. Um, so how do I research? I'm going to talk about that. Just a quick little preface, pre preface. Uh, this is all just my opinions. This is how I do things backed up by my own research and whatnot. Um, so I'm not saying this is the same process that everyone goes through it when researching, but this is just a way um, that I do research and I make research less difficult for myself. Um, so take from it what you will. I'm sure you will. Uh, anyways, research can be anything. Um, there are some catches to this, but I think that research doesn't have to be the stereotypical, I'm going to go to the library, open up a big textbook and research from it. Um, or it doesn't have to be, you know, scientists in a lab doing research into chemicals. It is that, but also it's other stuff too. Um, anything can be researched if you know what you're doing and if you're drawing information from it to use uh, in whatever you're using it in, whether it's art or science or whatever else you do, um, just your everyday life maybe. Um, however, the thing that I think um, really makes research research is passive versus active consumption. Passive consumption is when what you're consuming, the media you're consuming, um, or whatever you're researching, um, is on in the background. So for example, if I was uh, listening to a Beethoven symphony, and I just kind of had it on on a speaker to the side, and I was, you know, drawing or reading a book and just had the music on in the background, that would not be active consumption, that would be passive consumption, because I'm not actively listening to the, uh, to the symphony, it's just on in the background. However, if I was listening to the symphony in with like big headphones and I had the full uh, orchestral score in front of me with all the sheet music and I was following along, that would be very active uh, consumption because it was it's the forefront of what I'm doing and I am actively listening to the Beethoven symphony and following along. Um, research is always active. You can never be research, researching a book just by sort of flipping through the pages and taking what you want it's got to be what you're doing, uh, which is the hardest part because it's hard to devote a lot of time to doing something. But I think there are ways to make research fun and uh, entertaining. Now, but where do you find all this stuff to research and what's the right stuff? Um, there is no right or wrong answer, um, but I have a couple of suggestions. Like I said before, this information era where we have uh, everything at the um, touch of our fingers is very, it's very daunting to try and find information online. Uh, like, where do you start? It, everyone says Wikipedia isn't the right place to go, but Wikipedia is the first thing that comes up when you search about something. W is this website too old to learn this? Like, where, where am I supposed to go? And what about art? Where are you supposed to find art online? Um, and beyond finding where to find the right stuff, what is the right stuff on that website now in this age of uh, fake news and whatever, all this fake stuff that's happening online, where do you find information? Where do you, where do you find this research? Um, I, I, I don't know, but I have a couple, a couple thoughts. Um, so I'm gonna give you a bunch of lists of just places where I do research. Uh, if you wanna screenshot them, uh, write them down, you can. Uh, this is also going to be published on the YouTube, I think, so you can look back at it later. But here are just a, a bunch of places and mediums that I find research in. So places to find stuff. Here's a selection of places where you can do reading. Um, I've sort of, I've sort of um, categorized them into stuff that is reading and stuff that isn't reading, because I know um, reading is, there's a lot of information. The majority of information, I'd say, is in text form. Um, but then there's a, it's also very hard to read, especially if you're not, you know, in the right headspace to read or you don't have the time. So there, I'll, I'll get to um, other options of research later. But for now, um, 
places to find stuff where you read it. Uh, Wikipedia, I love Wikipedia. It's where I usually start when I'm learning about something new. Uh, I read through the wiki page and then especially the footnotes of the wiki page where they have all the references because um, Wikipedia is really excellently cited. Um, I've tried editing some Wikipedia pages and they've all got denied because I didn't have proper sources. Um, so if you want to find a great book to read, look at the Wikipedia footnotes and references. Um, there are some great books always there. Uh, JSTOR is a website where you can download free um, uh, journal entries and um, essays like uh, scientific journals and stuff about a variety of topics. I've read some um, like doctorate theses on there and other stuff of people talking about whatever. Um, great website. Project Gutenberg is the is a large um, a public domain collection of English uh, literature uh, and some non-English. It's great, uh, free, lots of great classic books if you're interested in classics. Um, your library, once the world opens up, I love I loved going to the like the reference library in Toronto and just like browsing the shelves or looking at their musical scores and stuff. Um, the library is a great place. Plus um, the library has a certain um, ritual. It's, 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 it's a very ritualistic to go to the library make a day of it, go to the library, do research. It really gets you in the right headspace. Um, even if you bring your own laptop, just to be in a library um, really gets you in the mood to just learn. At least it does for me. Um, so just going in person to the library is great. Archive.org is a website that has, I think, the biggest collection of anything on the internet. It's it's great. There's a, it's, um, it's this archive.org. Just go there, look through it. They have a bunch of um, books or texts that you can take out and like rent out a PDF, just like a real library. So I love archive.org. I think it's a, a really cool website. Um, they have books, texts, lots of stuff. Uh, what should I read next.com? Uh, exactly what the name suggests. Uh, you put in a book and it tells you what you, you should read next. Um, doesn't get more simple than that. Uh, there's other ways to do that too. Like sometimes I'll look up books like blah, 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 like my favorite book and I'll find another book to read. Um, so stuff like kitschy websites like that are cool. Uh, the Poetry Foundation is a cool website. Um, lots of poetry on there, modern and classic. There's a lot of poetry websites that I sort of flip through all the time and find poems that I like. Uh, I'm not too huge into poems, but I do, I do like reading them. So it's always great. It's always cool to find stuff. Um, and the short story guide is just a website with a bunch of short stories on it. There's a bunch of short story websites. There's no right one. Just flip through them all until you find something. Um, so yeah, so there's uh, a bunch of, you can read books, articles, essays, journals, poems, stories. Any of these, any of these are valid places to find, uh, to learn and to, to research, to find stuff that you love. Um, but these are all reading. So what about people who don't like reading as much? I, I personally uh, don't read a lot um, anymore. I'm trying to, I'm working back into it, but I, I think it's a lot easier to find, uh, to consume stuff that isn't uh, text-based. So I have a collection of those. Um, so where are places to find stuff that is not reading? Uh, the, the best and the one that I always go back to is my teachers, my mentors, my friends, and just people. Uh, conversation, gets you so much further than just finding it online on your own. Um, online on your own is great too, but just it's so good to have a conversation with someone and be like, oh, I love this book. And they say, oh, you should check out this one. Or, oh, if you like this, you should read this book or watch this movie or listen to this podcast. Um, um, I'll, most of um, uh, a lot of stuff I've started off, just it's been recommendations from somebody, especially people older than you, if you're um, of my age too because they, they know a lot more than you and they know a lot more books than you and movies and whatever. So if you say, I like this, they can say boom, boom, because they've just had more time to take in stuff. So just ask people for recommendations. Um, YouTube, people, like everyone will be like, oh my God, you watch YouTube, but isn't that like all just YouTube videos? And yeah, it is, but okay. I spend so much time on YouTube, just watching like video essays and learning about music and learning about art. YouTube's a really cool place. If you fall down the right rabbit holes, you can learn some pretty cool stuff. I found some of my favorite artists on YouTube. Um, I watched some of my favorite video essays. YouTube's a cool place. I really, I, and especially um, I love the visual sort of medium. So I, I can sit through a video essay and take a lot from it. So, and plus YouTube is just huge. Like they have a huge 
like variety of stuff. So I cannot stress it enough. I love YouTube, um, except for the ads. It's very like two ads at the start of a video, uh, whatever. Spotify and Apple Music, great places, especially if you need to listen to a lot of music or listen to a lot of audiobooks and podcasts. Uh, streaming is great. Um, there's lots of stuff on there. I don't even, I don't have to say that there's music. Uh, so it's great. Google Arts and Culture is a uh, website that has a collection of uh, art and culture uh, run by Google. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. It's, I, I, I found some, some, some of my favorite artists on there too. Um, you sort of just go on and you can select like romantic era French charcoal drawings or whatever, and they'll show you a list of all of, of images and you just click one and you can learn about it. Um, there's not a whole lot of information on that website. It's more just like the pictures and a little blurb, but it's a starting point. And then you go to the Wikipedia page and then you find the YouTube videos and whatever. Um, but Google Arts and Culture is great. Uh, Internetarchive.org, I mentioned that one before, but not only does it have books and uh, texts, it also has movies and software and audio. I, it's like such a good website. I like, I cannot stress enough. Internet Archive is probably my favorite website of all time. Um, I've watched some of my favorite movies on there. I've downloaded some great old fashioned software it's, and it's all free. Uh, so Internet Archive is, is a great, great website. Um, the library, go to the library again. I don't have to say that again, but go to the library. They have movies and they have uh, computers. It gets you in the mood. Also real life galleries. I uh, miss the times when you could walk through a, an art gallery in real life. Um, so that same as the library, the real life galleries really get you in a mood. They get you in the mood to look at art. Um, so real life galleries just, and, and it's all right there. You just have to walk from room to room and you have art right there. So it's uh, real life galleries are great. Uh, there's one last website that I really love. It's called the Cinema Club. Um, it's, they have a free independently produced movie every week from different directors. Um, and every week, just a free movie that you can stream. Um, really cool website uh, if you like ind like really independent movies. Um, yeah, so there's a, a bunch of other ways to find uh, information through conversation with real people, um, through video essays, through audiobooks, through podcasts, through music, through movies, and through visual stimuli being art or uh, posters or whatever. Um, so there you go. There's like lists of just places to find a research if you need somewhere to start. Um, but now maybe this made it even more challenging because now there's too much places to go find information. Now you where well, now now what do you do? Well, I have these three levels of research that I do to sort of categorize my own research process. Um, I will walk along these three with examples of my own research process and um, what they all mean to me. Um, so these three levels of research, the first one, I call it the initial spark. The second one is the connected media. And then the third is the worldly connections. If I had to sum up uh, how I do research with one sentence, it would be uh, down the rabbit hole, Alice in Wonderland. So the first stage, the initial spark, um, you have to find something somewhere that you've connected with deeply. Uh, it doesn't have to be any specific medium. Look at the stuff that is fun and hits you emotionally. Um, you got to find this by going out and looking for anything, which is all those websites that I listed. You look at them for an hour each day and find, you look at one website for an hour and a different one the next day and a different one. You just find, keep going until you find something that you're like, oh, hey, this really hit me. This is this is, this is hitting me deeply emotionally. I don't know why, but I really like this. Um, and this is a, it's a good place to start if you're, if you're lost or if you don't know where to go. Um, three, some examples of these initial sparks that I've had. Um, here, here are some, I've sort of kept it also in like these rows uh, if you want to follow along. So the ones on the left um, is very music based. Uh, when I was young, I really loved this musical. I'm really into musical theater. Um, by the way, don't bully me. Um, I really love the musical Sweeney Todd, The Demon Barber of Fleet Street, a great musical. I've loved it since I was a kid. Um, and it sort of opened my eyes to um, theater in general and music and stories told through music. Um, 
and it has uh, sort of fostered that love from a young age of music theater and theater through music uh, and music in general. Um, so I really owe a lot to that show for sort of being a catalyst. Um, and I loved it in the start because I connected to the characters and I connected to the story and I thought this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Um, so that was sort of a, a spark that led me down a path. Another musical example that really touched me is The Rite of Spring by Igor Stravinsky. It's a ballet um, for full orchestra. Very cool piece, very weird. Um, it sort of opened my mind to contemporary classical music and uh, moved me and stimulated my mind and made me think about music very differently. Um, so there are two musical examples of first sparks. Um, some other sparks, The Legend of Zelda, Ever since I was a kid, I've really loved the video game series, Legend of Zelda. Um, I played it with my cousin. I think he was the one who got, really got me into it in the start. Um, I played all the games. Uh, I mean, it's, it's nerdy. And I was a silly little kid playing Legend of Zelda on my 3DS, but I loved it. And I still love it to this day. Uh, I played Breath of the Wild and I love it. And my favorite is Majora's Mask. And I loved it when I was a kid, it scared me. And I stayed up at night because I was so scared, but it also stimulated my mind. Um, and it made me think about storytelling in a completely different way um, through non-linear ways, um, through very emotional ways. Uh, that, that game is uh, to this day, one of my favorite things ever. I, I just think it's so well-crafted. Uh, if you don't know about Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, I highly recommend playing it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good game. It's very well crafted, we're very story driven, uh, very dark, very sad, um, and also very fun. Uh, anyways, Legend of Zelda sort of fostered that love of storytelling within me and the storytelling through unconventional mediums. Uh, thanks, Legend of Zelda. Uh, there's this story called I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream, uh, another short story that really fostered my love of storytelling. Um, it sent me down a rabbit hole of reading short stories. It's also another great story, also really dark, not for the faint of heart. I like had to lie down all day after I read it because it was really weird. Um, but also it was really good. Most great stuff are weird. Um, so there were two uh, sort of story based um, sparks that sort of sent me down a rabbit hole. And the last one is uh, Marvel Comics. When I was really young, I had an art teacher who had worked for Marvel Comics um, and I took lessons with him and he really fostered a love of just art in general. and how to appreciate art. Um, and we would draw comics and, you know, read comics and it was really cool. Uh, he actually did the cover for that one up there, the 3D man. Um, and yeah, just that, that sort of experience of reading these comics uh, and learning about this kind of, this art and how artists work at, from a young age really um, sparked a love of art in me. So above anything else, that sort of spark was the one that made me wanna learn about art and learn about artists. Um, so these were all, a lot of them, these were young in my childhood and they sort of sparked something that led me down. And some of them were later on in my life, such as the Rite of Spring or I Have No Mouth and I'm a Scream. Um, but they were all sort of these moments that I was like, oh, oh, this is really resonating with me. So I'm going to follow, follow my passions for these things. The secondary <laughs> connections, you got to dive deeper. You got to take risks in what you're uh, consuming. You got to go down the rabbit hole. You look around the internet, you look around your library, you look around whatever database you want, and you go over every detail about something that you care about. You go down new paths. So you take one of those sparks that you had, whether it's a book that you read that you really liked, or a movie that you really liked, or an art piece that you saw in a gallery, and you look it up, you find the Wikipedia page, you find interviews with the artists, you find it, whatever, like literally just anything. And it's, uh, it's easy to go down a rabbit hole on the internet once you're just following a trail that you really like. Um, and soon, sooner or later, you'll find you have a whole map of secondary connections that all lead into each other. And you find a new spark that leads you in a new different direction. Um, if you do this like a little bit every day, you'll finally, you'll have a big, huge connection, collection of stuff that you know. Um, some things that I have led me in different directions. Uh, I've learned more about uh, different um, uh, contemporary classical music inspired by the Rite of Spring. Um, such as other uh, Russian composers, such as Shostakovich, um, his Symphony Number no. Nine, um, which is uh, recently I listened to it fully. Um, 
it uh, it taught me a lot about jokes through music and how music can um, send a political message without um, text or just through the music alone. It's a it's a cool piece. Um, and then uh, my love of theater has sent me down different theatrical venues of uh, learning, such as more musical theater or um, such as the absurdist plays of the mid fifties, such as uh, Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot, um, one of my favorite plays of all time. Uh, this that, that's the picture there. It's uh, in that play sort of also changed my mind of how I thought about uh, theater and how I think about theatrical conventions. Um, and I only got there because I sort of followed my path of learning about theater through the internet. Um, then through libraries and through reading books. Um, in this middle one, as I read more stories and as I learned about stories more and more, I eventually read Franz Kafka's The Metamorphosis, um, which to this day is my favorite story, favorite book of all time, maybe my favorite piece of art of all time. It's really good. I have it here. Um, it's, it's uh, yeah, I mean, it. Uh, if you haven't read it, go read the English translations. Um, there's a bunch, read all of them. They're, they're, they're really good. Um, there's one, there's a free one on the Wikipedia page. There's a link to it. It's not the best one, but it's a good place to start. Um, it's where I started. Anyways, the, the metamorphosis, I, I, I love it. I, it's my, it's, it's the greatest thing I've ever read, but I only got there because I followed the scent down from, you know, the legend of Zelda and I have no mouth and I must scream. And I went down the short story rabbit hole and through like people telling me, oh, you should read this if you like this, I eventually made my way to the metamorphosis. And on this far, uh, far right here, um, we have a, a drawing or a lithograph from Kathy Kollwitz, um, who is my favorite visual artist. Well, one of my favorite visual artists. Um, I saw her work in the AGO uh, one day and I was like, whoa, this is the most moving art I've ever seen. Um, I really, I really love her work. Um, this is from her series, um, Portraits with Death, I think it's called. Great, 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 beautiful um, drawings and lithographs. Uh, go research her for your own, you know. Um, but I only found her because I cared enough to, you know, go to the AGO and like walk around in it and re read about the artists. And I only cared about that because I had a spark from, long ago to learn about art and to love art. Um, and I followed the path to the AGO, the wormhole. Um, the last sort of layer of research is the worldly connections. This is where it gets a little more um, academic and you really got to love what you're doing to buckle down and learn about this stuff. Um, but you really, you understand how and why, you, um, how, why, or what you're doing works. Um, how it all fits together. How does it connect to your the worlds around you, the social world, your physical world, your microscopic world? How does how does your art function, or how does the media you're consuming function um, in the in the world? Um, this is usually like you know visual uh, or not visual. Um, it's essays and theory and a lot of weird stuff, a little more abstract. So for example, for me, some of these have been uh, through my love of theater and through my love of musical theater and just performance. I've learned a lot about um, performance conventions and theatrical conventions and how um, theater works and how theater is put together. Um, how it all, how, how, how a show fits together. I've learned a lot about that. I've also read um, Aristotle's Poetics, second time I've mentioning Aristotle, he's a cool guy. Um, I read his Poetics, which is the oldest surviving uh, text of uh, dramatic uh, theory. Um, that's the one on the in the middle here. Um, it it's the it's about Greek theater and an analysis of Greek theater, but it it's the start of sort of uh, Western traditional storytelling. So I learned a lot from that, and I learned a lot from how about how stories have been structured since the beginning of Western culture up until now. Um, very interesting. Um, that one was a little harder to get through because it's Aristotle. And I didn't read the Greek, but I read an English trans, I don't speak Greek, um, but I read the English translation and I thought it was uh, really hard to read, but I powered through and I'm better off for it. Um, I've also learned through my love of music and especially complex modern classical music, I've learned a lot about how music works, both from a theoretical um, standpoint and also a like physics standpoint and how um, music sounds different ways and why music works um, in terms of wavelengths and um, the th physics theory behind music. Because 
when you hear music and it sounds really sad or really um, terrible or really weird, um, it's not just some magic that's happening. Like it, it can be described through physics. So again, I'm just dipping my toes into all this stuff. Like I, I don't know everything about it. Uh, and sometimes I do get caught in that Dunning-Kruger uh, valley of despair um, where I think, oh man, there's so much to know about music that I'm never going to know. But uh, that's why I keep learning about it because I care and I want to become more confident in my understanding of it. Uh, I've learned about Kurt Vonnegut's Shapes of Stories, um, which is uh, Kurt Vonnegut, the author, Slaughterhouse-Five, cool guy. Um, I've watched some lectures that he's given on um, the shapes of stories, which was his whole thing about graphing uh, good fortune or versus ill fortune of a character throughout a story. Really cool stuff. I highly recommend learning about it. That one in the bottom uh, right there is the Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. That's his little drawing of it because it just gets worse for the main character. Uh, anyways, uh, really cool stuff. And then uh, I've learned just about more visual arts. Uh, I found some of my favorite visual artists uh, through Kath uh, Kathy Colwitz, especially uh, learning about lithograph series and etching. I found Max Klinger, who's one of my favorite artists, um, especially his series, uh, The Paraphrases on the Finding of a Glove, really moving piece, uh, really cool. Yeah, so th there's sort of my journey through everything. And I hope that sort of illustrated a, a path through which I followed that um, I just went down the wormhole. And it never felt tedious and it never felt um, like I was, it never felt like I was doing research. It just felt like I was learning about what I, what I love. Um, however, uh, yeah, uh, what do you do with all this research? Well, I take from the research and you steal from the research and put it into your own work. Um, this uh, is a piano piece that I've written and I'm in the process of writing and revising. It's a piano piece inspired by the metamorphosis because uh, I love it. Um, and it's, uh, I consider it a culmination of all the research I've done uh, throughout my life. I mean, everything I do is a culmination of the research in my life, but this one I can say, yes, I've, I, I've written the music through my understanding of music theory and how music works, as, as well as how storytelling works through music, um, because I'm trying to sort of illustrate the story of the, of the metamorphosis through my, through my pieces. Um, I also understand the metamorphosis and how the metamorphosis works, that book. Uh, I've read like all the translations of it and not all the translations, but a, a couple of the translations of it. Um, I understand through uh, how storytelling works and um, how adaptation works from a story to music uh, through all my research. Um, so this is sort of a culmination of all the research that I've done into this. Um, so I'd like to take you back to that starting point where I said, um, think about the story that you wrote when you were a kid and it was plagiarism and you just took from one story that you read and you loved. I think that there's no difference between that and doing research today other than the fact that you've just read more stories or watched more movies. When you were a kid and you were just inspired by one movie or one story, that was all you were drawing from because you, you were so young, that's all you read. You hadn't read a lot. Um, and that's the, that you took that and you put it into your own work. So that story would have been a collection of your own thoughts mixed with the book's thoughts. So it, I'll just through that, through virtue of being inspired by one thing, it would become a lot more derivative or plagiaristic, even if it wasn't meant to be. But the more media you take in and the more research you do and the more stuff you learn from your active research, the more you will understand different things and the more you will draw from them and mix into your own work. So the, so instead of just being one book that you really love mixed with your own thoughts, it'll be a hundred books, a thousand movies, you know, a billion video essays, 60 zillion theories that you've read, um, all mixed with your own thoughts. And through that amalgamation of all the research that you've done, it will become entirely your own. Um, but as long as you keep that same sort of love for writing and that same love for learning and reading that you did when you were a child, the reason why you were writing it in the first place. Uh, also, follow me on Instagram at Operation Clara, a merciless self-plug. Uh, and that will bring me to the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your support. Check us out at ESA Contemporary Art at Instagram and on YouTube at ESA Contemporary Art. Also register for more session, sessions today. Some very, very cool ones going on and today and tomorrow and for the rest of the week. Um, 
incredible people talking. They're very, very, very smart. Um, also, buy some work from USA. Uh, we're, there's some talented people here, very, very cool people. And hey, well, don't you want one of your our original pieces hanging in your house? I think you do. And I would also like to open the floor for Q and A's at the bottom of your screen. There's the little Q and A uh, button. If you have any questions, um, I can answer them. And if you have any questions, unless I was so clear that you understood it all. Um, yeah, you, you can use the Q and A function if you, if you have any. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Oh no, now you can see it all. No, I can't see the read the questions if I do that. That's okay. Um, we hope to reach new communities and expand on our own. I'm going to close the slideshow now to answer questions if you have any. Um, Q and A. How did I start my research journey, and what led to all of this? Um, I don't know. I mean, just a. Uh, Oh, this was this was earlier. Um, yeah, just uh, through through my love of reading stories and my love of learning about all this kind of stuff. Um, I did it because I I loved it as a kid, and I still love it today, uh, and I try to love it every more every day. Yeah, those are all. That's all the questions. Um, oh, do I ever worry about spreading out my time too much? Um, by spreading out my time, if you mean like, uh, what do you mean by spreading out my time? Like uh, doing too many things, uh, if that's what you mean. Uh, yeah, I think, well, worrying about spreading out my time, yeah, I, all my different interests. Yeah, yeah, all my different interests. Um, yes, I think that there is a danger, especially in what I'm doing. Um, because I, I try to do a bunch of different stuff in terms of visual arts and also music and performance and theater. And yeah, I, I think there, there is a risk in that um, in terms of getting to a high level at all of them. Uh, uh, like uh, if, if you do all of them at once, you may not ever get to a high level at all of them. Um, I don't know. I mean, I still got to work. Out, I still got to work that out myself, but I, I do worry about that. But I think that I... I research all of them equally and I'm dividing my time between them equally. Um, and my love for all of them is equal. Like I, I really, I really love all of them. So I, I think that I, if I, if I, I I'm, I'm working really hard at all of them. So I'm doing the best I can do at least. Uh, more questions. Uh, my favorite medium of visual arts. Uh, oh, geez. Uh, I work like for me to make, I work in a lot of photography. Um, that's all of my, in my Instagram is all my photography um, or a lot of my photography. Um, so for me, that, that's, that's what I really like to do. Um, but to, to look at, I really love charcoal and lithographs. Uh, like I mentioned with the Kolowitz work, um, really great stuff. Um, my favorite piece of art that I've created, um, God, I wrote a play when I was in grade nine called To Iron a Shirt, looking back, it was not that great, um, but I really loved it. I was really proud of it, and I still am really proud of it today. It was inspired by, it was inspired almost directly, almost a plagiarist, plagiaristic uh, venture. Um, Christopher Durang's play, Dentity Crisis, um, but uh, the, it was, it, it, Christopher Durang's a great playwright, one of my favorites. Um, I really, I really love that play. I still, it's, it still touches me to this day uh, that I wrote it. Uh, what inspired me to have this passion passion my love of art when when i was a kid uh do you think that oh do you think that being a high school student infringes on your ability to do research um no i don't think it does um i think you have to also have time to do homework and stuff which i never do anyways but you know um I, I, i'll try to make time um also i don't know what how we're going to do for time but if any of you want to contact me you can contact me on instagram if you want to say hey read this movie or read this book or answer this question I, I'll, I'll answer I'll, I'll do whatever um but no yeah i think that uh being a high school student is just it just means that you got to um we're all good for time okay um if so i just i you know just uh cut your time up between social media research schoolwork and personal life i think it's it's a balance Sometimes I do more research than I 
than talking to other people but it's all it's just whatever you want to do really like whatever whatever is sustainable um great presentation thank you uh i need some references for victorian era style piece geez um i don't know i'm i don't know a lot about victorian era style uh i might have to get back to you on that one um victorian era style i don't think that is the movie amadeus victorian era i don't think so but I don't know. I'm not. I don't know a lot about Victorian. That's more research I gotta do. Geez, I'll make that tonight. Um, Legend of Zelda. Yes, I watched the trailer for Breath of the Wild too. I wanna. I I want it so bad. I'm I'm looking forward to it. Uh, Legend of Zelda is so good. Um, are all the people at ESA like you and are nice people? Uh, they're all terrible people. They're all cruel and they spit on me in the hallway. No, they're uh they're lovely people. ESA is a lovely place. Um. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else right now. It's a, uh, it's incredible. Uh, you should go there if you're a, if you're a, if you're a student. You should also go to our five o'clock seminar, which I will be presenting at with some of my friends, um, on how to apply to ESA. It's they're cool people. Um, how do you find? How do you seek out and find new sparks? Yeah, that's like the the hardest the hardest thing. Um, it's really just looking through your YouTube recommendations, looking through the library shelves. Uh, talking to people and asking, "Hey, can you give me a book recommendation?" It's 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 uh, it's all pretty tedious, but that's like possibly the most tedious part, just um, having to go out and look for all the stuff. Um, it's really just hit or miss. You got to just work through it until you find something that you love. Um, yeah. Um, would you were you ever caught up in the bad route hole of endless social media? Oh yeah, I mean. Yeah, social media, like I, I scroll through it a lot. I waste a lot of time on it. Um, I mean, I, I try to just turn it into research, right? Like on Instagram, I follow a bunch of artists I love and I, and I scroll through, um, you know, meme accounts of like, I don't know, classic literature so I can find the next book. To, I found a book that I wanna read through like a stupid Instagram post. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, 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 maybe I'm just passing it off as research and it's just me wasting time, but I don't know. I, I think I'm, I'm finding cool stuff. Um, yeah. Social media is tough. I don't really, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. I, I, I'm a, I'm an abuser of social media. Um, if I, if I could go to any college or university, what I go to, geez, that's like, that's what I have to ask myself, like actually right now, cause I'm applying to universities next year. Um, I don't know where I want to go. I want to go uh, somewhere where I can have the opportunities to have my music performed, uh, perform myself, uh, like perform on stage, uh, somewhere where I have opportunities. I'm not so worried as much about the curriculum of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the university as much as I am the opportunities they can give. Maybe that's the wrong answer. Um, yeah, you can message me on Instagram about universities. That's a, a whole other topic that I need to figure out for myself. And then there are some in the chat. Um, it, sorry, it's for my to the school. I'm at, yeah, oh my gosh, go come to ESA. It's they're lovely people. You'll find your your little niche uh, so easily at ESA. Um, it's a it's a cool place. Uh, and there's lots of places to do research. The ESA contemporary arts rooms are all walls of books and shelves of books and stuff. Um, yeah. Oh, one more question. Oh my gosh. Why, how do I get over lazy slumps? Um, a lot of the time I don't. Um, and I just, well, no, that's not true. I, 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 I force myself to, um, to work. Like it's people, people often think like, oh, art is so different from the rest of the, uh, the world in how like you know, carpenters just have to go to work or accountants just have to go to work and do it. And art is like this higher thing where you get hit with inspiration and it comes out of your hands like magic. Um, that's like completely not true. There's no difference between um, art and carpentry. Like you're not a great painter because you have a gift. It's you're a great painter because you work really hard. It's like you're a great carpenter because maybe when you're you, you when you were young, everyone was like, oh, you're you're really good at the woodworking. You're really good at this. But you don't become a great carpenter by a gift. You like you work really hard. So I think that's the same for art and it's the same for getting over lazy slumps. You don't get over lazy slumps by waiting for inspiration to strike. 
you get over lazy slumps by hating yourself and saying, I got to draw garbage and I have to get it all out and edit it later. And I have to do research into stuff that I don't really care about right now um, in order to get to somewhere that I do. It's like, it's not fun. It's not fun to get over lazy slumps. It's painful and annoying, but I, I just force myself to. I have a, I have a play that I've written that has been there for like two months that I have yet to edit. Um, but I, I will, I promise. I tell myself that every day and I have a little red pencil sitting right there on my desk and it's looking at me like I need to edit that play and I'm not. Maybe I'll do it tonight because of your question. All right, that looks like all the questions. All right, thank you everybody for coming. 1 p.m., character design, go see it. Cole Cannon, Kate Snyder, great presentation. Um, oh, one more question, if we have time. Uh, has researching something ever turned you off a topic? Um, no, it's just steered me in a different direction because there's no wrong answers in research, only stuff that'll lead you down a different rabbit hole. Okay, there we go. Contact me, Instagram, at Operation Clara. I would love to talk to you, um, talk to you about research, talk to you about ESA, universities, um, anything. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, that's all.